So I'd like to talk today about some examples about how the COVID-19 pandemic is affecting collective intelligence in the real world and how collective intelligence can in turn help us respond to that real world pandemic. First, I think one of the most important ways COVID-19 is affecting real world collective intelligence is by dramatically accelerating some changes that were happening anyway, but that would probably otherwise have taken much longer. In a sense, I think the pandemic is like a bullet train to the future. For over three decades, I've studied and written about the effects of digital communication on business, and society, and other forms of collective intelligence. And some of the changes I thought would take a decade or more happened in a few weeks in March and April. For instance, almost everyone in America who has a job that can be done remotely has been working from home. And many people are discovering that they really can do much of their job from a distance. Of course, when lots of other things in society are disrupted too, like schools being closed, this doesn't always work out perfectly. But for many people, it's working better than they would have expected. And I think many people are asking themselves, why do we really need to commute an hour a day to meet with people who can, we can already see and talk to electronically. Of course, sometimes face-to-face -face meetings are necessary. And when things go back to quote normal, we'll probably go back to having some of these meetings. But I think many people will be surprised at how often, once we're used to doing it, many jobs really can be done from anywhere. And that means more and more people will make decisions about where they live, not based on where their job is, but on what they want to be close to outside of work, whether that's beaches, mountains, or the excitement of the city. Now, this clearly has implications for real estate. For instance, I think it's likely that expensive urban office space like this will be less valuable in the future. But I think many people will probably still, probably still won't want to work in their own homes. So among other things, I think we're likely to see a new kind of office become much more common, what I call neighborhood office buildings. For instance, think of suburbs where every block or two, there's a former house converted into office space. Maybe this building, for instance, would be converted into workspaces for six or seven people who had different jobs, working for different companies, but who all shared a coffee machine, a chance to socialize with each other, and a commute consisting of a two-minute walk from their nearby houses. Now, in addition to changing where we'll work, I think as we get used to doing more and more work online, the work we'll do will change too. In my recent book, Superminds, I gave dozens of examples of kinds of collective intelligence that I think are likely to become much more common in the future. For example, many of the people in this collective intelligence community have been talking for years about things like prediction markets, and crowdsourcing, and online democracies, and many more. For instance, another example when many tasks can be done from anywhere on the planet, new kinds of hyper-specialization become possible. One person, for example, might be a hyper-specialist only in answering arcane questions from account accountants all over the country about how to treat business entertainment expenses. Someone else who specializes in multiple areas might spend the morning evaluating the feasibility of pieces of Apple's strategic plan, in the afternoon estimating the probability that specific individuals are planning terrorist attacks in, say, Yemen. So I think these are all examples of new kinds of collective intelligence that would probably have happened anyway, but that I think are likely to happen much sooner because of the pandemic. Now let's talk about how we can use collective intelligence to deal with the real COVID-19 pandemic. Of course, there's lots we could say about this, but I wanna give you three examples of things we've been working on in the MIT Center for Collective Intelligence that I think could be useful. The first is something called the Pandemic Response Collab, which we just publicly launched yesterday, as a matter of fact. Uh, my primary collaborators on this project include David Sun Kong, Kathleen Kennedy, and Annalyn Bachman. And 
our focus here is on crowdsourcing as a form of collective intelligence, building on our experience with Climate CoLab, where we have over 120,000 registered members developing and evaluating proposals for what to do about global climate change. But in this new project, we're focusing on the project of how to respond to the COVID pandemic. At the center of the project will be a variety of challenges like this one about designing masks and other face coverings to optimize things like wearability, comfort, and style. And in this challenge, we expect to draw on the diverse kinds of knowledge in the general public to come up with innovative answers to these questions. There will also be more technical challenges like this one on how to use innovative materials and other technologies to enhance the functionality of face coverings in, in different settings. And here we expect to draw on a crowd of people with much more specialized technical knowledge than in challenges like the first one I showed. Now, as many of you know, challenges like these have been common in a number of other open innovation platforms for years. And we think it's important to apply them to one of the most critical problems our world is facing today. But in this project, we're also focusing on crowdsourcing two other kinds of challenges that, as far as we know, haven't been used before in the context of open innovation platforms. The first kind of challenge in this, of this type is about finding and defining what are the important problems to serve, solve in the first place. Here, for example, is a problem finding challenge where a number of people have already entered problems that they think are important that are related to the pandemic. Some of these are widely shared problems like how to develop personal protective equipment for agricultural workers. Others might be very specific like how to provide groceries to seniors sheltering in place in a particular retirement community in say Lowell, Massachusetts. So you could think of these problem finding challenges as upstream challenges ahead of the main problem solving challenges. And we also expect to have downstream challenges to help people find, to help find people and other resources to implement good solutions that emerge from the problem solving stage. For instance, one of these downstream challenges might help recruit volunteers to deliver groceries to the retirement community in Lowell, Massachusetts we just talked about. So together, we hope these three types of challenges will help harness new kinds of collective intelligence to solve important problems like, for example, what to do about the pandemic. The next idea I wanna talk about is based on an op-ed I recently published about how to deal with the massive unemployment caused by the pandemic. The basic idea is to use a new digital version of something like a program created by the US government after the Great Depression in the 1930s. The original program was called the Works Progress Administration, or WPA. And the WPA provided government funded jobs for millions of unemployed workers, mostly building roads, hospitals, and other kinds of public infrastructure. Today, we have an option that wasn't available then. That is to create a digital WPA, where the work is digital, not physical. That means the work can be done from anywhere, so it can still be done even if we have to continue or reinstate some form of social distancing for an indefinitely long time. And it even provides a bridge from unemployment today to the digital jobs of tomorrow. Many of the workers in such a, such a digital WPA could do tasks that are desperately needed to cope with the pandemic, like tracking the contents, contacts of people who are infected or coordinating care for homebound seniors. They could also do lots of other kinds of work like monitoring security cameras in government buildings, converting medical records to electronic form, or doing all kinds of other collective intelligence tasks that I think people in this community could come up with. And wouldn't it be better if we could pay people to do urgent, socially important work like some of these things, instead of just paying them for being unemployed? 
one of the key collective intelligence problems to be solved in doing this is how to match workers to work. And one intriguing possibility for that, I think, is to use the kind of online labor markets that many people in this community know a lot about, like Mechanical Turk, Upwork, and others to do this matching. Now, of course, a, a digital WPA isn't a panacea for all our unemployment problems. People in the 1930s sometimes joked that WPA stood for we poke along because they felt the WPA employees didn't work very hard. And it won't be trivial to determine the right mix of pay levels and work requirements to motivate workers while still providing incentives for the workers to return to the private sector when they can. And in this government supported version of a gig economy, it will also be possible be important to avoid creating digital sweatshops and instead to provide livable incomes and reasonable working conditions for the workers. But it certainly seems that something like a digital WPA could be a very powerful treatment for the massive unemployment this pandemic is causing. Now, the last thing I'd like to talk about today is how the pandemic may accelerate our progress in overcoming a limitation in today's video conferencing tools. As we're all experiencing in this conference today, Zoom and other video conferencing systems are already very good for many kinds of scheduled meetings from two people to hundreds of people. These tools aren't always as good as in-person meetings, but they're often close and sometimes even better. But as many of us have also experienced, there's at least one very important thing that these tools don't do well. And that is supporting the ad hoc private conversations people often have before a meeting, after a meeting, or in the breaks of a meeting. It's long seemed obvious to me, and probably to many of you, that it should be possible to support this kind of ad hoc interaction online too. And about six weeks ago, I realized there was a pretty simple way to do that. So Jayun Sung, an incoming MIT PhD student, and I started working on software to do that. We recently added Chris Weedle to the team to focus on data analysis. And as I should have known, it didn't turn out to be as easy as I thought. But I'm very happy to say that we managed to get a system working in beta test form in time to use at this conference. And you'll all be able to try it out starting in the next break in just a few minutes. The system is called Mingler, and it tries to replicate many aspects of the kind of ad hoc conversations we all might have in the lobby if we were here in person instead of online. Here's how it works. On the left, you see a list of people at the conference who are available to talk and you can select ones you want to talk to. In the middle, you see who else, if anyone, is waiting for the people you wanted to talk to. And on the right, you see the people who want to talk to you. If you select one of them, then both of you go into a private video room where you can talk for as long or as short a time as you want. The software uses an open source video conferencing system called Jitsi. And for those of you who are interested in using or contributing to Mingler after this conference, we're planning to make it available soon as open source software. And we would welcome users of the system and developers of the software to join. We'll also send a survey to all of you after the conference to learn more about your experiences in using Mingler. Now, my hope and expectation is that some version of this basic functionality will be useful in very many situations not just academic conferences, but also business meetings, classes, parties, and many other professional and social events. So I expect that some version of this functionality will eventually be implemented in all the major video conferencing systems. But you have a chance to use it here today. Now, why is this important for collective intelligence? From a collective intelligence point of view, Lots of research suggests that the kind of random ad hoc encounters 
that tools like Mingler will support online are often key to creative innovations in cities, research labs, companies, and lots of other places. And from our own personal experiences, we also know that these ad hoc interactions can often be critical to building social connections and a feeling of bonding and camaraderie in a group. In fact, I think these kinds of ad hoc interactions are among the most important things people miss in today's work from home environment. And as Mingler shows, new technologies could help provide these things online too. So I think this online mingling is another example of how the pandemic is accelerating us like on a bullet train into a future where much richer kinds of online interactions will be key to our social engagement, our collective intelligence, and I hope our collective wisdom. Thank you.